G'day everyone, today we're going to walk through how to print cyanotype photograms on fabric. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about tote bags, but this advice will work for any fabric or garment that you wish to try. Before we get started though, you might be wondering what is a cyanotype or what is a photogram? The cyanotype was invented in 1842 by a bloke named Sir John Herschel. It was one of the first non-silver photographic processes, utilising a solution of iron salts to form an image when exposed to UV light and then washed in water. The original architectural blueprints were actually made from cyanotypes, and it's from its distinct blue colour that they got their name. A photogram is a term used for when something is laid on top of photographic material, and the image captured is its shadow or silhouette, rather than of its likeness. This technique has been used in cyanotypes for decades, with one of the first examples being the plant life in Anna Atkins' book, Photographs of British Algae, in 1843. In the instance of this tutorial, we're combining the technique of the photogram with the process of the cyanotype. To kick things off, let's get the boring stuff out of the way and talk about the safety equipment that you should be using. Now, lots of people don't worry about OH&S too much with cyanotypes, but in my opinion, it's always better to err on the side of caution when you're working with chemicals. I'd recommend having safety glasses and disposable gloves to avoid any of the chemistry from coming into contact with your skin or your eyes. I think it's also a good idea to have a plan in place to rinse your eyes if any chemistry does get into them and have something like a portable eye wash bottle on hand. It's not such an issue if the chemistry gets onto your skin. In this case, just wash it under the tap with some soap. It's also a good idea to have a respirator when you're mixing the powdered chemistry or spraying the cyanotype solution onto the bags, as well as doing these two steps in a well-ventilated room. Finally, it's not a bad idea to have an apron or some clothes that you don't really care too much about while you're making the cyanotypes, as the solution will stain pretty much anything it comes into contact with, especially if it gets exposed to UV light. The first trick to getting a successful print on fabric is choosing the right fabric. You want to use natural fibres, things like your cottons, linens, silks, stuff like that. But you don't want to use synthetic stuff like polyester. I'm using cotton tote bags, though you'll want to be careful that the ones you get are actually what they say they are. These cotton tote bags I bought from Timu, for example, didn't work very well and likely aren't actually made from cotton, at least not completely. Regardless of the type that you get, give the bags a wash before you coat them to remove any of the factory residue. I wash mine in the washing machine on a rinse cycle, but make sure that you don't add any chemicals to the wash or have any chemical residue in the detergent section or it will defeat the purpose of doing this. The cyanotype chemistry is really easy to mix and it's fairly easy to source. There are a number of ready-made options too, such as pre-mixed chemistry or even pre-coated materials. If you want to mix the chemicals yourself, then you'll need a few things to get you going. You're going to need three 1 litre bottles for your part A, your part B and then the mixed solution. You'll need two 1 litre beakers for mixing the chemistry together. You'll need a chemical stirrer and you'll also need a set of scales capable of measuring smallish quantities of powder. There are a few different recipes for cyanotypes, but Herschel's original solution still works well. To make Herschel's formula, you'll need two chemicals, which will make up your part A and your part B. Part A consists of 25 grams of ferric ammonium citrate plus distilled water to make 100 milliliters of working solution. Part B consists of 10 grams of potassium ferrocyanide plus distilled water to make up another 100 mils of working solution. These two solutions make up your part A and your part B, and by themselves they're not light sensitive and will last longer when they're not mixed together. The best way to operate is to keep them separate until you need to use them and mix about 24 hours beforehand to give them a little bit of time to stew. Once they're mixed, you want to make sure that they are held in a lightproof bottle as any UV light will cause the solution to expose. Now that the chemistry is ready, it's time to coat the tote bag. Wherever the chemistry ends up has the potential to leave a mark, whether it gets exposed or not. But there are a couple of ways that we can prevent this from happening. The first way is to mask out the areas which we don't wish to coat. I'm using some gaffer tape to create a border around the edges of the tote bags, which will help prevent the chemistry from reaching these sections while we apply it. This step isn't essential and you can definitely coat the whole bag if you'd like to, but I find that a border gives the design a neat to look in the end. With the border masked out, we can begin to apply the chemistry. You can do this with a brush, and while I prefer to use a brush when I'm coating onto paper, I find it's much harder to do this well when you're using fabrics. As the material will be much more absorbent, you'll likely use a lot of chemistry and it will be more likely to bleed under the mask. My preferred method when it comes to fabrics is to use a spray bottle which will allow you to evenly coat the fabric without using a heap of chemistry and without it bleeding too badly. Spray the solution with slow controlled bursts to reduce the amount of chemistry which bounces off 
and methodically work your way around the edges and into the middle. Make sure that you've coated everything you want to, but don't go too overboard and saturate the material. Even if the coating is a little uneven, the chemistry will soak in and distribute more evenly while it dries. Make sure that you're wearing a respirator while you're doing this and coat in a well-ventilated area, as some of the chemistry is gonna find its way into the air. Once the fabric is coated, leave it somewhere in the dark to dry. The fabric will need to be bone dry before you continue, otherwise you're gonna get issues with your image. To make the print, we're gonna to have to first choose something to put onto our fabric. You can make a photogram out of essentially anything, but flat objects or those which can be squished tend to work better, particularly when you're using a light box. Before beginning your exposure, a few extra materials are gonna make things a little easier, which include a foam insert the same size as the tote bag, a stiff backing board, and a thick piece of glass. For the backing board, a 10 mm piece of plier MDF will be good because you'll want something that's not gonna flex. For the glass, I got an eight mm piece cut from a local glass distributor, which is enough to weigh everything down. I find the softer foams work best as the purpose of this is to reduce the creases and the wrinkles in the bag when we lay the flat objects on top and then the heavy glass on top of them, giving us good contact between the bag and the objects. The two most common methods of exposure are the sun or a UV light box. If you do use the sun, then you can get away with capturing 3D objects a lot easier and capture things like the beautiful refraction of light through things like crystal glassware, and you're also gonna get much crisper shadows when you're using these objects. You can basically just take the bag outside, pop the objects on top, and wait until it's exposed. You might wanna first tape the bag down though to the backing board, otherwise it's probably gonna blow around in the wind. When exposing 2G objects, you'll wanna do a little bit more prep. Pop in your foam insert, put the bag on the backing board, and then lay the objects on top. Do this in a dim space away from UV light so that the exposure doesn't start until you're finished with your prep. Once you're happy with the arrangement, pop your glass over the composition to keep everything flat and then you're ready to go. Now asking how long to expose for is a bit like asking how long is a piece of string. Depending on how opaque your object is, you don't need to worry too much about the exposure as the object's gonna block any light from getting to the chemistry underneath it and preserve its silhouette in the final photo. For more translucent objects, you're gonna to need to factor in the light that's passing through it as well as the light that's passing around it. And try not to overexpose everything and just end up with a featureless blue. This means that you'll need to find the time where the uncovered parts are reaching their maximum level of blue and use this as a guide for your exposure time. Expect to go through some trial and error while you're working this out and it can be really useful to have some coded test strips of the same material that you're gonna end up using so you can do some test exposures before you commit to the final photo. To use the test strips, place an object over the top that you're wishing to use for the final photo and make an exposure, noting down the exposure time. Give the test strip a wash and see how it looks. If the image is too light, then it is underexposed and you'll want to increase the exposure time. If it's too dark and you're starting to lose detail, then it's overexposed and you'll instead want to decrease the exposure time. It's best to start by making adjustments to your exposure by a factor of two, either halving or doubling the time you're exposing for. Once you get into the right ballpark, you can then start to make smaller adjustments and to tweak it in whatever direction you need to go. You can also test when you're reaching the maximum level of blue by cutting up some small sections of coated material and exposing them for two, four, 8, 16, and 32 minute intervals. Once the color stops getting darker between the steps, you've reached the time it takes to reach maximum blue for any part of the bag that isn't covered. When you're using the sun, it depends on a number of factors, including what time of day it is, the weather and the season, and where in the world you're doing it. In Melbourne at midday, you're looking at exposure times in direct sun of around five to 10 minutes, but it really depends, so do your own tests. A light box makes calculating exposures much easier because once you've dialed it in, the exposure is always going to be the same. But in our light box, we do exposures of around seven to eight minutes, which we've gotten to after plenty of testing. You'll know your exposure is complete when the solution turns from green to blue to a kind of dull bluish gray. When it's finished, take the bag back to your preparation space and remove any objects you've placed on top. Now it's time for the final step, which is giving your bag a wash. The washing process is fairly straightforward. Pop on a pair of gloves and then start giving your bag a rinse in the sink. I use a bucket to do this so I can see the color of the runoff water as we need to keep washing until this water runs clean. Keep soaking the bag, squeezing the green water out, emptying the bucket and filling it with fresh water. Repeating this process until you can no longer see any green runoff. 
Sometimes, to be sure that I've gotten all the chemistry out, I'll also pop my bags into the washing machine when I get home and put them on another rinse cycle. Before doing this, be careful that there's no washing detergent or residue left behind in the detergent compartment, as this is gonna cause the image to bleach. When the bag is washed, leave it somewhere to dry, and now your cyanotype tote bag is complete. With some love and care, your tote bag should last for a fairly long time. There are a couple of things, however, that can cause the image to fade or disappear. UV light will cause the print to fade over time, and while the image shouldn't disappear completely, you might find that the blue becomes less intense. This isn't something I would stress about too much with normal use, but while you aren't using the bag, store it in a dark space, which will keep it away from UV light, and also actually help recharge some of the lost color. You unfortunately can't really wash the cyanotype bags as any phosphates, bleach or sodium in the detergent will cause the image to bleach. If you do need to give it a wash, then a rinse cycle with cold water will be your best bet to preserve the image and hopefully get rid of any of the dirt and grime. You should have all the information you need now to make a cyanotype tote bag yourself. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments, otherwise I'll catch you on the next video.